next uh, abstract is uh, uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan versus trastuzumab emtansin in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Updated survival results of the randomized phase three study, Destiny Breast 03. It will be presented by Dr. Sarah Hurwitz from UCLA. Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to the planning committee on behalf of my co-investigators for Destiny Breast 03 to be part of the uh, press program here. Um, these are my disclosures. So as Dr. Kropp just presented to you, um, the first line standard of care for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer was established to be trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and taxane based on the Cleopatra trial. And the AMELIA trial established trastuzumab emtansine as the standard of care therapy after trastuzumab and taxane in the second line setting and beyond, based upon the strength of the previous becoming an alternative option. At the previously reported Destiny Breast 03 trial results last year, the PFS interim analysis showed in the TDXD arm the risk of disease progression or death was reduced by 72%. The median PFS had not been reached at that time for TDXD and was 6.8 months for TDM1. This is the study design for Destiny Breast 03. It's a randomized open label phase three trial. Uh, patients had to have metastatic or unresectable HER2 positive breast cancer previously treated with trastuzumab and ataxane in the metastatic setting or within six months of a recurrence after early stage treatment. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to TDXD or TDM1 every three weeks. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival by blinded independent central review with a key secondary endpoint of overall survival. Stratification was based on hormone receptor status, prior receipt of pertuzumab, and history of visceral disease. The pre-specified overall survival interim analysis was planned with 153 events, and at the time of data cutoff, 169 events were observed. The p-value set to achieve statistical significance was 0 0.013. At the uh, overall survival interim analysis, the median overall survival was not yet reached for TDXD or for TDM1. However, the curves do separate early in favor of TDXD with a hazard ratio of 0.64. And this was statistically significant with a p-value of 0.0037. In the TDXD arm, it's notable that 35% of patients who came off treatment were able to go on and receive standard of care TDM1. In the TDM1 arm, 17% of patients went on to receive standard of care TDXD. The updated progression-free survival results are shown here. Now we have reached a median progression-free survival for TDXD of 28.8 months, which is around four times better than that seen with TDM1 at 6.8 months, a hazard ratio of 0.33. The objective response rate is shown here. The majority of patients treated with TDXD experienced a reduction in tumor size. The ORR was 78.5% with TDXD versus 35% with TDM1. 21% of patients had a complete response versus 9.5% of patients in the TDM1 arm. And the duration of response was uh, just over three years with TDXD versus just under two years with TDM1. Overall uh, safety summary is shown here. It's notable when you are looking and comparing the safety between the two arms that patients treated on TDXD were treated for a median of 18.2 months, so their treatment exposure was much longer than with TDM1, where the median treatment duration was 6.9 months. 
Grade three, four TEAEs were fairly equivalent um, comparing the two arms, 56.4% with TDXD versus 51.7%. But similar to the DBO2 data just shown uh, by Dr. Kropp, there were more treatment emergent adverse events that led to drug discontinuation reduction or interruption with TDXD versus TDM1. The most common TEAEs with TDXD, all grade, were nausea, vomiting, and alopecia. In comparison, the most common TEAEs with TDM1 were low platelet counts, um, liver enzyme elevations, and nausea. And any grade ILD and pneumonitis rates for TDXD, again, an AE of special interest, was 15.2%. Now, at the previous reporting a year ago, that number was 10.5%. However, there were no grade 5 events, no grade 4 events, no new grade 3 events. The additional accumulated events were all grade 1 and 2, owing to the longer follow-up and the longer treatment duration in this arm. In conclusion, TDXD demonstrated a clinically meaningful and statistically significant improvement in overall survival compared with TDM1, as well as continued PFS benefit. Uh, there was uh, TDXD reduced the risk of death by 36%, and the median PFS with TDXD was four times longer than with TDM1. 78.5% of patients experienced a confirmed objective response, and one in five patients treated with TDXD had a complete response. With longer treatment duration, TDXD continued to demonstrate a manageable safety profile, similar rates of grade 3, 4 AEs, and no grade 4 or 5 adjudicated drug-related ILD or pneumonitis. So these updated results do demonstrate remarkable OS and PFS benefits solidly placing TDXD as the standard of care after trastuzumab and taxane. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Sarah. The, um, so this drug clearly improves survival, uh, but can you comment on the, uh, what is your thinking about the significant of the in intrathecal lung disease? Does this change your thinking about it? That this should assure you that um, it should be manageable? Uh, how do we assure patients about that side effect? And also, uh, do, do patients that uh, develop this toxicity, can they be retreated later on when they recover from that side effect with TDXD? It's a great question. Um, it is interesting that the rate of all grade ILD did increase with this increased time. Um, most of the studies that have reported on TDXD have reported across histologies rates around 15% of all grade mm -hmm. ILD. What's notable about this trial is the lack of deaths, the lack of grade four events. And I think um, if you look at a time course and sort of our use with TDXD since it's become widely available in the last two to three years, I think we're becoming better at catching it early when it's asymptomatic. We hold therapy even with asymptomatic grade one ILD that's only seen on scans and we don't resume until it's resolved. With grade two, we completely stop therapy and should not resume therapy ever. There's a hard stop now. Now, there are investigations looking at whether or not we can safely retreat patients who had grade two that then resolved, but that should only be uh, done in the context of a clinical trial. Moreover, we should, as clinicians, continue to follow CT scans of the lungs closely in our patients being treated with TDXD because this is an event that can occur even up to a year or longer of a patient being on therapy. Thank you. Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Ortega, um, in your opinion, what do, this is Aaron Talent with Oncology Business Review, but in your opinion, what do these two studies tell us, uh, add to our knowledge about TDXD and what questions remain? Uh, well, we have a drug that is very effective and seems to be working at least in good part by a targeting mechanism against HER2. Uh, it also uh, may speak to the uh, genius of the engineering of the drug that has this bystander effect. So it's like combining, say, a taxin with Herceptin in a way. Uh, there are questions to remain, and I was going to ask Dr. Harvest that, what is the pathogenesis of the interstitial lung disease? 
Is this something reminiscent of irinotica and associated lung toxicity? Is this, uh, again, uh, an effect of the chemotherapy part that may not necessarily be targeted to HER2 because uh, HER2 lung tissue does not overexpress HER2? So I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think much is to be learned about the pathogenesis of ILD, as well as how we can uh, identify patients at higher risk for ILD. We don't think that it's presence of lung metastases, for example. In this study, we previously reported that um, patients from Asian countries don't appear to have a higher risk of ILD. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for clinical features as well as um, demographic features that may give us an idea of who's at higher, highest risk. Should we be doing p um, pulmonary function tests proactively, um, et cetera? These are questions that are being interrogated on, on clinical trials. I think additional questions that remain for TDXD that are very exciting, not only its benefit in the first line setting, which I think we'll know soon, but how it works in patients with brain metastases. We have some interesting data from this study, from the Tuxedo and Debra studies, and from ongoing studies that are enrolling patients with active progressing brain metastases. Um, so this is sort of changing our paradigm thinking about the ability of bulky molecules to cross the blood-brain barrier since we did see about two-thirds of patients with brain, baseline brain metastases having an objective response in the brain in this trial. So this study included patients with brain metastases? Yes. About 15 percent of patients had brain metastases at baseline. They had to be stable and asymptomatic. The majority had previously been locally treated. So this is not a HER2 climb type trial where patients had untreated, progressive um, brain metastases, but it does give us some interesting um, hints to the activity of this drug. Uh, and, and any, have you rebiopsied any patients to prog that progressed on TDXD to see whether they remain HER2 amplified? I have not, but my colleague, Dr. Bardia, will be presenting just now a study that does have a rebiopsy as part of the study design, and I think studies like this in the neoadjuvant setting are going to give us really important biological uh, data to, to help inform what's happening in the tumor in situ uh, after, before and after treatment with this drug. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, lot of, lots of questions remain, but so far so good.